I'm Jane Rawson. Uh, I write fiction, uh, novels, novellas. I've written a non-fiction guide to surviving climate change. I write short stories and essays, and I also get paid to write often about environmental issues at the moment. I'm working for the Tasmanian Land Conservancy, doing just that. <laughs> uh, so, as we, we, we established, I'm Ben Walter, <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, I'm primarily a writer of experimental fiction, which is another way of saying fiction that nobody reads, um, <laughs> uh, often with a, a nature elements uh, attached to it, but not always. Um, but I also write across poetry and uh, non-fiction as well. When somebody, I usually write non-fiction either when I'm really angry about something or when somebody says, could you please write something about this? And then it's really straightforward. Outside of that, I haven't got a clue what I might write non-fiction about. Mm. Um, so that's, is that good? Yeah, I think that's good. Do yeah. you feel yeah. like you know us a little bit now? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> we'll, you know, we'll, get, we'll look forward to continuing to make your acquaintance as the evening proceeds. Um, one of the things, though, that, as you would have noticed, is we're both writers, and I'd want to start today by saying that writers feel lots of things. They feel bored, they feel frustrated, they feel miserable, and all the rest of the good stuff like that. Um, there's an old episode of Faulty Towers, which you might remember if you've seen it, where John Cleese's character, Basil's won some money at the races, and his wife, Sybil, says that he seems sort of happy. Happy, says Basil. Oh, yes, I remember that. <laughs> and sometimes it can be a little bit like that as a writer. Um, you know, you're enjoying your time at the desk, it's going well, you, you sell a piece you're pleased with, someone tells you like, they, they liked a story that you've written and it's like, happy as a writer? Oh, yes, I remember that. <laughs> um, but sometimes it can really be a slog. And one of the things, though, that it's easy, very easy for writers to feel amidst that general sort of discomfort is irrelevance. Um, the world of books and writing is so much smaller in scale than many other forms, like TV or video games or whatever's getting the internet in a flap at the moment. Um, particularly if you are working in more creative or artistic styles. For the most part, you're writing to small audiences, but it often feels like you're writing to no audiences. Um, there's no instant hit of applause like a musician or dancer or theatrical performer gets. It's just you in a room, with an aged computer and a rapidly cooling mug of coffee. And if you're trying to do this while writing about climate or the environment, it can be really discouraging. It seems like you're not making any difference at all. And I think, in a way, that's common to how many of us feel about environmental matters generally. Yeah, there are things we can do, but it can seem like we're not really getting anywhere in the face of what appear to be totally overwhelming challenges. In the area of writing in particular, it doesn't help that fiddling with books or articles or stories or poems is often framed in our culture as an implicitly frivolous activity. Uh, it's something non-essential. We don't generally ask questions like, uh, why wire houses in the face of climate change? Or why do medical research? Because these are seen as straightforward, integral parts of society. While well, a question like, why write books when the world's about to end, seems a little bit more natural to our ears. Writing can be seen as a, as a luxury. It's like um, the first class trip to Monaco when we should just be camping down at Cloudy Bay. So is writing really like this? Is it ephemeral and non-essential in the face of environmental crises? I want to ask you, can you imagine how the debate would be changed in this country if the Murdoch papers changed their tune on climate. If Rupert was wandering down the road to Damascus and had a sudden flash of insight that his billions weren't really that important after all. In Australia, Rupert Murdoch's power is based almost entirely in writing. How's that for relevance? But what sort of writing? I want to argue that writing in general is a legitimate hobby or profession which people can just do because they're people. But it does get complicated by the fact that writing is about conveying information, whether it's a fantastical unicorn story 
or a technical manual for dishwashers. And so the question inevitably gets asked, what kind of information do you want to convey? What's worthy and what's not? And as a writer, if you care about major environmental issues, shouldn't the information primarily be about them in some way? Maybe. Maybe not. If you're an environmental journalist, then sure. But for other writers, it's not so straightforward. And we can be led astray, I think, by this fact of information being convey conveyed to put an unfair imperative on writers. They can just be doing their job or pursuing their interest by writing crime novels, even if the world is about to end. Because they're humans doing human things. Plumbers aren't expected to plumb houses for climate as such. And even if we're in desperate strife as a species, good plumbing is still important. So we shouldn't be led astray by the fact that writing is about information to argue that it must be a certain sort of information always delivered in a certain sort of way. And as much as I care, I wouldn't want to read only that. Would you? Nonetheless, many writers do feel this imperative and there are a number of approaches they can use to bring environmental themes into their work. And I think this has to be seen as a useful thing. I mean, the Murdoch example shows that writing changes things. It's not the only thing that changes things. But it's one of them, and for skilled writers, it might be the best thing that they can do. To be really honest, I'm not going to be the guy who leads an organisation or a movement or go into politics after about three months I would feel bored and stressed and anxious and miserable, even more than if I was just writing. <laughs> I was going to say something about writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even more than if I was just writing. Um, but writing is the thing that I can do. And as long as we keep the expectations reasonable, we can recognise the power that's there in small successes. I mean, there's always lots of focus on the big stuff, the hero, the messiah who can change everything. And, and I think this is dangerous for us, actually, because it makes us feel like the contributions we can make are irrelevant and useless if we're not operating at that kind of a level. Not everyone is going to be Greta. We might be, but not everyone is going to be. It's just a practical thing. Not everybody is going to be sort of Richard Flanagan thundering in the Guardian powerfully. That's not the role for all of us, but it doesn't help, that, so it doesn't um, change the fact that we can have helpful contributions to make. If you write a piece or have a conversation that convinces just one sceptic that they're wrong, isn't that a useful act? If you're writing work that encourages or gives heart to the people who are fighting for the environment in a different active way, isn't that a useful act? If you work to shift the centre of Australian culture just, just a little bit, that can have a tremendous impact on what society sees as important or normal. The climate models themselves are like this. We see a shift of two degrees can make for an enormous change in the weather we're likely to see overall. And I think cultures like that too. If we can shift the culture just a little bit, the far right over here won't be able to make any difference. Look at what happened with the issue of gay marriage in Australia. In some ways this might be a harder issue, in some ways not. But we can, I think as environmentalists, use that as a model of how what was once a really polarised matter, a really polarised issue, can be overcome by the sheer weight of a culture's shift in a relatively short space of time. And every piece of writing that helps explore environmental matters, every person shifted just this far, is a part of that process. What models do we have for writers to do this? I think there are three main ways that writers can seek to influence the world around them. And I'll go through just a little bit on these and then I'll hand over to Jane. Um, I think firstly we can take really obvious avert approaches, overtly arguing for environmental matters in longer forms like books or shorter forms. Um, the most obvious territory here is environmental journalism or opinion pieces. I mean, Naomi Klein's just released a new book in this sphere which collects her journalism on these issues and you see a lot of reporting, as mentioned, in The Guardian and other publications like it. 
We understand this, right? It's a fairly straightforward way of making an environmental case in writing. And you can extend this to personal essays. Um, but beyond this, as we work our way into forms that have a more artful or creative bent, uh, these overt approaches get a bit trickier. Joanna Murray-Smith, the Australian novelist and playwright, says at one point that good writing is all about asking questions but not delivering answers. She says it's all about making the world more interesting and more complicated and more perverse and more confused. And the danger is that a, a strong environmental message can subvert an artwork. The artwork can feel reduced to its message, um, delivering too many answers and not enough questions. And this reduction can just be less compelling because uh, it often ties itself in our minds. It, 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 hooks, it hooks its fingers with the world of newspapers and politics and government and arguments that we already feel we know and understand. It's departed, in a sense, from the vision of the artwork. And the vision is really all an artwork has. I mean, you lose that, you may as well just have handed out a protest flyer, which may have its own place and its own usefulness, which we might come to later, but it's operating in a different sphere. So how do we mesh these literary values with environmental values. It is possible to create good art that argues directly, I think, for nature conservation. There's some people who say that there isn't, um, but I think that it is possible. And there are some forms that lend themselves more to this. Political poetry can do it. As we said, certain sorts of essay, the satire and polemic. Um, it's hard in narrative, but you do get the real sense of the futility of war in books like Slaughterhouse-Five or Catch-22, um, romantic or even sentimental approaches can valorise a certain way of life. You can show the outcomes of climate destruction in post-apocalyptic. So there are ways that you can do it. It's harder though. Ian McEwan tried to do it in his novel Solar seven or eight years ago and it was a really bad book. It was a really bad book. <laughs> That's the risk. Um, and any overt approach carries that risk when you're not just doing journalism. I think. Um, I'm not making an argument against it. There's definitely a place for them, but maybe sometimes I think the best thing to do is to be, try and recognise the limitations of that approach um, and find a way through it. And I'm really interested in doing that myself. Uh, Rob handed up a, a copy of the latest Island, and I've been, I guess, exploring a, a territory of experimental nature writing that tries to do that in some sort of way. Um, the other way that you could probably do it is to provide a different context for the work. If you're providing an educational context for the work, you can do it. Uh, if you're providing a context that takes account of completely different spheres of writing, as you know, copywriting, which we suggested, you can probably do it. That's one way, overt approaches. The second way, a more subtle one, I think, is for writers to try to portray the sense of a place, to bring an audience to a place or a process or a reality without them having to go there directly. And I think some of you probably would have seen the, the big punch bowl project that was done through the Tasmanian Land Conservancy a, a couple of years ago. That characterised that. The idea is you take people to a place through the work. Um, and it's not just a place, as I say. You can do it as a process. You can do it as a reality. You can do it as a system. Wilderness photography belongs here, doesn't it? Other forms... Uh, of art where the elements of a place, the, the wallaby grasses, the wattle trees, the currawongs, uh, the southerly wind, all, all of these things are transformed into another language, you know, art in the visual language, uh, dance in terms of the language of bodily music, uh, music in terms of the language of sound. All of these things try to portray the sense of a place or process so that people have greater understanding and appreciation of it. A lot of nature writings like that, or environmental writing. That's another way. And I think a third way and totally legitimate direction to work in is to involve the, the natural world or environmental issues as compelling elements in a work that's also and perhaps primarily about something else entirely. It might just be part of the normal fragment, sort of fabric, sorry, fab, fabric of reality. Um, where what's just assumed to be real and, and important is portrayed as part of what's going on in the text. Um, sometimes it'll carry a greater load, sometimes it'll carry a symbolic weight, but it might be just what's going on in the world around us. And you do see a lot of that in Tasmanian writing, 
For obvious reasons, the natural world really is just part of the scenery. And all of these approaches in general, though, I think can be useful for writers and for writing because what they're ultimately doing is making an issue of the natural world or climate change or other environmental matters at a time where these issues can be hidden or perceived to be irrelevant for a whole lot of people. If the natural world's hidden and the only way you're going to get people to engage with it uh, is to understand what it is and why it's worth conserving, and you're only going to do that by either taking them to it or bringing it to them in some way. And writing's about communication. It's something that you can communicate to people to give a sense of what these realities are. The first battle in any conservation issue or any issue at all is that people have to know and people have to care. And I think that's a role that writing can play. Handing over to Jane. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> We've, we've taken a slightly interesting approach with this in that we've both addressed the question without really talking to each other a lot about what we were going to do. We gave each other a kind of brief idea of what we might cover. So like Ben said at the beginning, there is going to be a little bit of crossover here. Um, but I am going to introduce an element of danger by using a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> that may or may not work to keep you all on the edge of your seats, uh, which also means we'll need to dim the lights so I might not be able to read my notes. <laughs> Why write books when the world is ending? <laughs> is this a question that bakers ever ask themselves? Why make bread when the world is ending? Do used car sales folk ask themselves, or banking business analysts, or tour managers? Writers are singularly obsessed with portraying their art and work as a waste of time and a moral failing. <laughs> Even though its negatives, environment-wise, are almost entirely non-existent. The footprint of writing a book is approximately equivalent to sitting around doing absolutely nothing, <laughs> which is largely what writing a book involves. Considering that most books written are never published and thus never consume or waste resources, it should be a completely guilt-free undertaking. But somehow we still convince ourselves that we should be doing more, that somehow our talents, if we have them, should be used elsewhere or if we have no talent, that we should chuck in the writing and instead chain ourselves to a tree or something that would be more useful. When a baker opens the oven door and sees her bagels are less than perfect, does she ask herself why she didn't join the Stop Adani convoy instead? No, she starts another batch of bagels and vows to bake better. May I have another slide please, Rob? This is working great. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, the fact that the vast majority of books have no negative, in, negative effect and have in fact generally no effect at all should be enough to justify writing. But <laughs> let's assume that you don't accept that and that you demand writing books has a positive effect on the state of the world, if it's to continue. What evidence can we find that books do make the world a better place? Is there anything that can justify Ben and I frittering away our hours on writing? Can books make a difference? You might have heard that science has shown that people who read literature have more empathy and are better people, kinder, than those who read thrillers or romance or sci-fi or who read no fiction at all. And I am, I should say, I'm primarily talking about fiction and novels during most of what I'm talking about today rather than non-fiction writing or more sort of uh, instrumentalised writing, I guess. Um, so yeah, surely that is a good reason to write books, even when the world is ending, if we can show that reading books makes the world a kinder place. So let's look a little closer at that research. This claim that reading makes people more empathetic is based on two studies, both of which use the reading the mind in the eyes test, which you can see an example of up here. In this test, people look at photographs of actors' eyes and say what the actor is thinking. They get four states of mind to choose from. The test asks, essentially, how well you can guess another person's state of mind. So to literature. The first of these empathy and literature studies showed that people who were given a literary short story to read fared better on this reading the mind in the eyes test than those who read a genre sto short story, say crime, sci-fi, something like that. The second study asked people to choose from a list the names of any authors they recognised. Those who recognised more literary authors 
were better at this test than those who recognise genre authors' names. So, <laughs> in summary, people who have heard of John Updike at some point are better at guessing whether an actor is angry than people who recognise Ursula Le Guin's name. It's compelling stuff. <laughs> Made even more compelling by the fact that no subsequent research team has been able to replicate these findings. <laughs> so let's accept then that there is no evidence books do anything to increase readers' empathy. And certainly no evidence to suggest that books make readers better people. So what are they good for? I'd also like to apologise for the quality of the photographs. I know there are probably photographers here. So uh, yeah, some of them are shocking resolution. I believe that books are a source of comfort in terrible times. One of the worst aspects of the climate catastrophe and of ecocide, at least for people like me who aren't really directly affected yet, is the feeling of being a screaming lunatic in a world of calm and reasonable people. Talking about the deaths of gorillas when people just want to buy a nice new Samsung Note tablet or leaving a rich and rewarding life in Melbourne to escape the coming catastrophic heat island effect can lose you a lot of friends. Reading books where other people are aware of the situation that the world is in can help a reader like me feel like they're not alone. And I think that writing about these kind of issues is a type of mental health service for others. In her recent Goldsmiths lecture, Why the Novel Matters, novel matters experiment, experimental writer Emma Mc... I can't speak anymore. That's it, I'm out. <laughs> Emma McBride said, the novel's importance lies in its ability to understand and communicate the infinite loneliness of the individual experiencing their world change in an instant and realising that it will never change back. It speaks to my anxieties about the direction the world is taking, my feelings of powerlessness within it, and to my only surviving hope, which ironically is exactly the same as my fear, that eventually and inevitably everything must change. What else? Books are also a record of a time and a place in our case, an elegy, an insight into what people are thinking and doing. Novels are a historical document because they don't just tell about the physical aspects of a society, but about its emotional and ideological aspects as well. When I write, I'm leaving a record for the future of who we are and why we behaved in this way. But even if my writing doesn't get published or my published writing doesn't survive, Writing is still the best way I have of working through my own thoughts and ideas and feelings about my role in climate change and in ecocide, about what I might do, about what I want all of us to do. Writing untangles my brain. It makes me functional and available for other activism. It helps me figure out where I want to direct my energy. As far as I can tell, novels that set out to change people's behaviour, as Ben said, rarely succeed. Novels aren't like campaign emails. They don't have a clear threat, solution, call to action. They're unlikely to make people donate money or glue themselves to a road. But I do think that novels can broaden and shift readers' conception of the world and their place and their responsibilities in it. This shows some of the books that I think have changed me as a person. You mentioned Slaughterhouse Five. That was nice. Um, they've, I guess they've skewed my view of the world. They've, they've opened some cracks in what I thought I knew. They've made me less certain. They've shown me how weird things can be and how open things are to change. And they've educated me on the work necessary to be a moral, ethical person and on some of the ways that I might go about it. Barry Lopez, who is a nature writer primarily, um, recently released a memoir called Horizon. And in it he says, what act of imagination will it finally require for us to be able to speak meaningfully with one another about our cultural fate and about our shared biological fate? One can choose to step into the treacherous void between oneself and the confounding world and there to be staggered by the breadth, the intricacy, the possibilities of that world, accepting its requirement for death but working still to lessen the degree of cruelty and to increase the reach of justice in every quarter. And when I set about writing a novel, ambitious as it is, that is what I set out to do. These are three of my books. Two novels and a non-fiction guide to surviving climate change. A Wrong Turn at the Office of Unmade Lists is set in Melbourne in 2030. It's hot too often, the rivers flood a lot, transport infrastructure is flaky and so is power and water. There are a lot more poor people than there are now and there are more arriving and becoming poorer all the time. I wanted to help people imagine a possible future. 
but I also created a world where imagined things have begun seeping into the real world. I wanted to talk about how powerful our minds can be in creating a future or getting fruitlessly lost in the past. In From the Wreck, a shipwreck survivor meets an alien shapeshifter in 1860s Port Adelaide, and everyone ends up hurt and confused. It's a book about how humans refuse to recognise the personhood of other species. It's about how we make aliens out of our closest animal relatives and we punish them for their strangeness. And it's about how we only ever really consider ourselves. It suggests that more openness and acceptance might take a huge weight off our shoulders and help us to make a world that we could actually love to live in. And the one in the middle is the handbook, which is a non-fiction guide to surviving climate change. Which of them has done more good in a world that is ending? There's absolutely no way for me to know, um, but the novels have sold more copies. Uh, can I have my last slide, please? Amy McBride again says that the novel matters not because it is a comfort, although perhaps sometimes it is. Not because it assures us that we are not alone, although we may sometimes find that welcome knowledge there too. Not because it inspires us to be a better version of ourselves, although I can think of a few people I wish would crack open their George Eliot a little more regularly. It matters because in a world ever increasingly bounded by imperatives handed down by others about acceptable ways to think and speak and live and be, the novel and the journey we take with it between its covers allows us to be free. When the world is ending, perhaps the most important thing we can try to do is to imagine new worlds, different worlds. Or as great Tasmanian musician Costume recently tweeted, in a culture that actively works to alienate you through fear and desire, the best response is to create your own world to be in. That is what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I have questions for Jane. Okay, Jane may have questions oh, for I've me, but I wonder if it's worth opening up just to give people a chance to uh, think in a, in a different way rather than just having us blood the living. So has anybody got any questions that they'd like to start us off on? Yeah, Rob. To me, the process of writing is what's really interesting, that it's like this amorphous space that you place yourself into and most interesting writing is about what will come out the other end. And I think that process, like it's a very human uh, and deep process. And just that process itself is a good thing that we are doing as human beings. And I think that's really important. That wasn't interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We've, we've been at literary festivals. We don't need actual questions. Like they can write. Um, but for other people, Thinking precedes writing. Um, do you want to sp say anything about that, perhaps? Because some people write as is drivel, but other people, <laughs> but you know, it, they write it beautifully. It, it comes out very well. But one it's... of the exciting things about being a writer is that you're never sure which one is you. Um, I, I don't know if that's true for you or not, but yeah, just often you are struck by the thought, oh my god, what if this is just absolute nonsense? But how did, how did and the other side to it is that even if you are sure that work you've produced in the past was on the right side, you're never sure the next time which you're going to be. You know, there's no stability there. <laughs> so, there's no certainty at all. What, yeah. what, how, did, how did you come to start writing? Were you just born writing? Um, I don't think... Well, I don't know. I mean, some people talk about this as being the thing that they were always telling stories or always writing stories. I don't know if I was or not. I think I was always reading stories. That's what I feel like it is for me, and that reading almost created a horizon of reality that I always wanted to then be a part of, or well, if not always wanted to be a part of, always saw it as a desirable reality. And so um, the way that you participate in that beyond just reading is, is writing, in a sense. I mean, you can just keep on reading, and that's great. That's probably what more people should just do, is just stay with the reading side. It's much more fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's quicker. It's quicker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the, another way of doing it and a, a way of belonging to that reality is by writing. And I think I probably also, you know, I did that as you try different things. I failed at other things. And uh, writing became a, another live thing where I thought, well, hang on, this is something I can do. And foolishly, I chose that. I thought that was a good idea. And so you end up sort of almost also being trapped as a writer where 
you end up spending sort of years and years learning a skill which is utterly useless. <laughs> you, know? and you end up not being able to do much else. Um, so that's a, um, I think you, I think writing is something that, um, in that sort of sense, I, I, I pursued as a reality to, to maybe making an own reality, as, as you quoted at the end there, Jane, but not something which. Um, well, it's a reality that clashes with other realities, put it that way. Yeah. I, I feel more like it's a reality that expands what we think of as reality. I guess for me, yeah, it was it was reading first and especially the books that you read as a kid and often give away when you're older are fantastical, um, have a much broader idea of what reality is than, than what you're expected to consider it when you're a grown-up. Um, and I think for me, I... One of the main reasons I wanted to write is that I would get ideas in my head of, well, what if it wasn't like, what if it's not like people are telling me it is? What if things are different? What if they could be different? What if they already are different? Can I describe that? Is there a way for me to convincingly explain to other people how that world might look inside my head um, and to introduce them into it for a while? And to try and do it in a way that might trick them into reading it, because if it's you know about elves or something like that, then most people will be like, I'm not reading that, it's about elves. Um, so to have it take place in a world that is very similar to our world, to lure you in with that. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, the idea that you can just make up a whole bunch of stuff in your head and create it and make it real as a writer is very exciting, whether anyone ever reads it or not, I think. So your writers have been successful in publishing and so on, and they've obviously enjoyed the experience and felt creative and it's taken them somewhere personal. Do they, can they recapture that by rereading their own work, or is that cringe-worthy <laughs> and you get self-critical, or, or do you just expand your mind further and think, well, there's further possibilities? What happens if you read your own work? I, I have to do it, because I you know, go to writers' festivals and things like that. Um, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes there are shocking moments where I feel like, I don't remember writing that. That came from somewhere completely different. But last week I did a radio interview and she asked me to read from a book that I'd written for the first time in 2000, so it's like 20 years old. And I was like, I can't read this out loud. It's too horrible. Everything about it is so bad. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers that question. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on that? I think sometimes you get lucky with some stuff. I, I, I get the feeling that... Most of the stuff you look back at and you hate because you've moved on from it. And in some ways, every piece of writing, particularly really, really writing with an artistic bent, not always, but, but particularly that, um, has to be the product of a very specific vision at that time um, in terms of what you're doing. And once you've moved on from that vision, it's a little bit like thinking about what you were like as a 20-year-old. And, you know, for me anyway, thinking back to what I was as a 20-year-old, it's awful, you know, you just think, oh my goodness, because you partly you're the same and partly you're different. And that difference and that moment of disjunction is a really striking moment of disjunction. And I think it's the same thing looking back at a, it can be the same thing looking back at a piece of work that you've written some years ago, because it, again, it, it's the same, as, it's that part of you, but it's now different because you've moved on and you're thinking in different ways and you're writing different things. In saying that, sometimes you're lucky and you're surprised. I, I was just saying to Jane the other day, she. Jane read a story that I wrote a few years ago and I was saying to her um, that it was one of those stories where I still look back and I'm still kind of happy with it. I, st I, still, I still feel kind of fond of it. And in another few years, I might hate it. <laughs> but at the moment, I'm still in the sphere where I can look back at it and feel sort of kindly disposed towards it. So I think, I think mostly that's the case for writers anyway. That's my sense talking yeah, about Yeah, I think, I think yeah, so, yeah. 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 Uh, I think I've only got a half-baked question, but uh, it probably had to do with the fact that whilst you were talking, I was in a room filled with uh, art and words and you know, all the things we've just been discussing. But I also felt like the premise of this uh, talk is a bit like, you know, why make art, full stop? Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of feel a bit like this is a constant question, and I don't. I want to know what your thoughts as to why we are constantly having to have this discussion. That actually ties in with a question that I was going to ask Jane, which was where I framed it in some ways, that question, as a question that society 
reflects on in terms of the, the place of writing as being frivolous. Whereas in the early parts of your talk, Jane, you, and I, I do agree with this as well, but you framed it partic particularly in terms of how, how writers feel about their work. And I was wondering um, if you think that's a broader thing, because I get the sense that I mean, in Australian society still, you, if, you were, if you were in somewhere like Germany, if you were in somewhere like uh, uh, France, if you were in a, another country that really valued its writers, to ask a question like, why write books when the world's going to win would be a nonsense question. Um, and I feel like that's because that, those societies, as societies, value the place of the arts in a different way to that which we do in Australia. So I was curious to hear what your thoughts were in relation to, is it really just something writers put on themselves? I mean, they do. Yeah. But, but is it really just that, or is it a broader issue? Or was it really issue? just for comic effect? Yeah, yeah. It was mostly for comic effect. Yeah. Um, but I do think that we have a, artists of all kinds often have a deeply ingrained self-hatred, um, which I think it does come from that pressure from outside that says, this is, this is a waste of time. You know, if you're taking taxpayers' money to do this, couldn't that be used for hospitals or something? What, what right do you have to be self-indulgently doing this thing? And as I say all this, I'm, part of my brain is like, yeah, what right do I have to be doing this self-indulgent thing? It's a waste of my time and everybody else's time. But on the other hand, I also feel like as we have come to this point of crisis in the world, that that is a question that probably should be asked of bakers and plumbers. Um, what, if, what are you contributing to help fix this? Why, why are you out fixing pipes? Is that helping? If it's not helping, maybe you should be thinking about doing something different because you know, this is an emergency. You should so be writing a book. <laughs> you maybe should be writing a book. Have you thought about that? Um, so yeah, I do think it's an eternal question for artists of all kinds that is probably an unreasonable question. I, I sometimes look at the kind of writing that I have done for years for organisations, most of which are ethical organisations trying to do something worthwhile, and the kind of writing that I have done on the taxpayer dime when I've had a grant to write novels. And I feel like my writing as a novelist is actually more effective and more worthwhile and more useful than campaign writing that I've done to convince people to use less energy in their homes. So when I think about that, I feel like, yeah, well, actually, you know, that's pretty good use of people's money out there. But yeah, more generally, it often weighs on me as a terrible thing. Why do, why do you feel that that has been more useful? <sighs> the quality of my writing is better yeah. when I'm writing a novel. Um, yeah. The work I'm creating is more compelling, more readable, more entertaining. Um, it has a longer lasting benefit in that it will stick with you, I hope, if you mm. read it. If you read a whole novel that I've written, I think I'm getting pretty good at that. You know, I've written a few now. Um, whereas the kinds of things that you write to uh, instrumentally convince people to do things are often pretty rubbish and based on theories that get debunked all the time and are often based on very little themselves and don't work. So, mm. yeah. So that's one of the things I was wondering about is if if you think that really, um, I guess writers of real quality could turn their hand to more instrumental writing approaches, because that's why I guess I mentioned the copywriting side to things. Like, I mean, is there a place for, say, a really elegant literary writer to write a protest file and so to bring all of that, the, the artistic skill that they have into play to write, you know, 300 words drop it in letterboxes down the street and see, I mean, I, I wonder if, you know, the s part of the, the issue is for writers is that uh, they may confine themselves to a certain sphere. And I'm not wanting to say that that sphere is, is a problem or bad or anything yeah. like that, but I wonder if um, by engaging in other contexts for the work, you can use these overt approaches in, in different ways that might not otherwise be being used. I think. I, my feeling as someone who has, I consider myself someone who can write with some literary merit, um, yeah, <laughs> and that I have, uh, not all the time by a long shot, but sometimes used that in my paid writing work. Um, I've, I think I've been doing like 25 years of, of writing to try and change minds in some way or another for money, and I think I've come to block your ears. I think I've come to the conclusion that writing can't change minds. It doesn't, even, even a beautifully written protest flyer will get the people who thought they were going to go and hadn't quite got around to it and now maybe thinking, oh yeah, maybe I will go after all. 
to go and do something, but it's not going to, someone who never had any intention of going is not going to read a beautifully written flyer and go to a thing. I guess that's why I wonder though about the place, because why well, I use the language of shifting the centre. Yes, Cause, cause, cause yeah, I thought that I was scrolling okay. here. Because yeah. I think that often it's really, really hard to convince somebody who has so many preconceptions mm -hmm. um, against a position. I still think it's possible. It, it's one piece of writing is unlikely to do it, right? But it might be a, a cumulative weight of pieces. Over time, it's like, you know, the advertising theory that says, you know, that you need, what is it, six points of contact or something with a, a work, whatever. <laughs> it that, changes that, all the It changes all the time. Yeah. But this, this notion that it's the multiple exposures to something that is what ultimately brings about change in, in somebody's behaviour. And, and I get the sense of that, that, that you know, perhaps as a cumulative effect, one piece can have a role um, with the person who's already opposed. But then I wonder about that place at the centre that the person who then is sort of uncommitted, that doesn't have a really firm view either way, but moves this far. I feel that that has an impact as a society. That's, that was certainly the principle we were operating on when we started the conversation, a website that I used to work out where we would commission academics to write informed pieces in their area of expertise about current news issues. So our aim, particularly with the climate change work that we were doing, was yeah, was pretty much that, to, um, to debunk the things that people who denied climate change were saying, not in an effort to change the minds of people who denied climate change, that's a waste of time, but to shift people who were a little unsure or maybe leaning this way a bit slightly <coughs> in the other direction. Mm. Did it work? I have no idea, but I think that what writing can do, and that was what I started thinking about when you were saying that, is that if one person speaks up and says, this is, this is how I'm feeling about this, or this is, this is my thoughts about this, then it gives courage to all those other people who have been thinking similar things but have felt like, but you know, everything in the papers says this isn't real. Mm. Everything in the papers says, of course I should fly to Hawaii for my holidays. Mm. Everything in the papers says I need a new phone. Mm. Um, it, it lets people hear that, well, that everyone doesn't think that. There's a lot of people who don't think that. Mm. And, and if you don't think that, you could say that too. And then we might realise that actually most people don't think that. Most people think we're in trouble and we should be doing something. So the fact of it representing a different reality. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Should we open back up to the floor? So, if it's any of this is spurring sp sp yeah. any other <laughs> reflections or questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Personally, I think um, you've you've hit on the perfect thing, um, Jane. You were you were talking about um, how your voice as a writer will not change your mind, um, but I think there's a cumulative effect when you work with other artists, visual artists, cinematic artists. Um, that cumulative effect, that multiple pronged attack where people who are out there in that middle ground get hit from multiple directions, from academics and artists and multiple types of things, uh, multiple angles, it does have an effect. So, please keep writing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Just coming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, think, I think it helps to create an understanding, a shared understanding of what is just normal and real. Yeah. I mean, I think, and there's, there's, I think that's a, a really important part that, you know, all people who are involved in communication, which means all of us, can, can play. Because if we can continue to make an issue of these sorts of matters, it helps to establish that they are normal and real, which they are, you know. Um, whereas if, the sort of the papers that are, are purely interested in selling you the, the flight to Hawaii uh, have their way, and that's that financial interest in creating that particular what is considered normal and real and what your expectations are as a person in society. So, yeah, sure. I totally hold with that comment. Yeah, yeah and mm. I think um, that for people who have cared deeply about environmental issues, which is probably all of you, um, that in polite society it has felt like a shameful thing to talk about often. Um, that it's embarrassing, it's naive, it's a hippie-ish kind of thing to talk about. And when you were saying that, that started me thinking about perhaps an analogue for this is the, the Me Too movement, in that, you know, you, you don't want to be the first person to speak up and say, well, yeah, actually, you know, I was sexually assaulted as a child, or, you know, my piano teacher did this, or my boss did that. But once you hear a few people talking about it, you're like, oh, wait, this happens to everyone. This is a real thing. This is something we should be talking about that we need to change. 
So that pressure that's on us to not talk about embarrassing things like climate change is a big deal and we need to completely change our lives, that pressure starts to crack once you start mm. all writing about it, speaking about it, reading about it, yep. creating art about it. Yep. Yeah. Um, it seems to me, I mean, writing is obviously a fantastic craft to take your ideas from something and to shape it in a way that it achieves the things that you kind of ask the questions you want to do. But it seems to me that so much of the writing that you guys do and that I really like comes from this long process of thinking about a whole bunch of things. So this is a bit of a cheeky question because I want to ask what are some of the things that you're thinking about now but that you haven't got the chance to write about yet, but specifically, what about the future environmentally scares you the most? and what gives you the most hope? This, when I come to do things like this, I, I think I want to do it and then I get up here and I'm like, I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> this stuff's really scary and it makes me feel terrible and sick. But here we are. Um, you know, the other day, I, the other night, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, oh yeah, what if you know, we can't get any food anymore and what am I going to do if we're going to starve to death? And you know, what will, what, Do I have a plan for that? Anyway, the doctor gave me some Valium and now I have heaps of Valium. <laughs> so I was like, I guess I could just take all of it. So, uh, so, but yeah, that kind of struck me. I was like, that, that is a thing that could actually happen to me in my life, that, that you know, I now live somewhere reasonably isolated. I could have trouble getting access to food because of all this. That's pretty scary. Um, I've got like a hundred fruit trees, James. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you're going to arm yourself. You've got, you're going to have three children to feed. You're not giving me any fruit. Um, yeah. Yeah, so getting a prescription for Valium <laughs> finally gave me hope. Um, I guess, yeah, what gives me hope? Um, <laughs> would you like to talk for a minute and I'll think about that? Yeah. I, I, Danny, I recognise there, there are two parts to your question. And in some ways, I think the, the, the scared hope one is the easiest one, I, I, I feel, because I, I actually have just stopped reading miserable mm -hmm. climate change journalism. And it's yeah, not because I, I think that stuff's really important and I'm prepared to do it, <laughs> but I'm not prepared to read it because it doesn't, it's not helpful to me in any way. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just reinforces a fact that I know to be a fact and all that is likely to happen is that I'll just get really unhappy and miserable. And that doesn't, I don't see the use of that necessarily, mm. unless it also makes me angry, because angry is likely to make me act in a certain sort of way, but it's not the only thing that will likely make me angry and active. So my antidote to that is if, I, if I'm reading really miserable stuff, I just go on to the Renew Economy website, um, which is the website based around um, providing news in the renewable energy space in Australia, and read three or four articles of that and say, oh yeah, no, people really are doing stuff. It's not the newsworthy thing. It's not the. It's in, in a funny sort of way. It's not the most important story to tell because the most important story to tell is still to be convincing people that things still need to change. But I feel heartened by the reporting on the stuff that is changing, and and that makes a difference to me in my daily life. I think though in the the thinking and the stuff, what we might be thinking about now. I feel it's really complicated because I'm really peculiar <coughs> as a writer. Like, I'm a really, really strange writer. And I don't say that as a sort of a conceit or whatever. It's just what I am. I have to bear the brunt of that because it means that I'm not writing stuff that, for the most part, people have a lot of interest in reading. But um, what I'm often interested in doing is creating a strange work that synthesises all sorts of threads that I'm thinking about at the moment whatever that happens to be, whether that's a fairy tale that I'm reading to my four-year-old and this major emotional impact that I felt about something else. And I find my interest is in drawing these things together to create something different and visionary in, in a way that hasn't been done before. And I don't use visionary in, the sen in that sort of overweening vein sense, but just something, what I mean is something very, very distinct and unusual in a way, in, in, in a sense. Um, so I don't necessarily know what the thing is that I'm going to be doing next because in each instance I'm finding whatever the, these threads are that are interesting to me and I'm saying somehow these would work together. The world is sufficiently diverse 
the language and ideas are sufficiently diverse that there is a way to mash everything together no matter what it is. And the fun part is finding out how it works. Um, so I can't answer that question, but I, I'm, I'm, I am exploring that experimental nature writing space of trying to reflect on, which is just, so far as I can tell, I mean, it's certainly not done in Australia, and I'm not sure if it's done anywhere else. Nature writing is a really conservative space in terms of the form. It's great writing, but it's conservative. It's the, done the same way as it's been done for a really long time, for the most part. There, um, And so trying to mess with that approach and bring in fictional elements and heightened elements and non-real elements and playing around with that is a really fruitful space. Do you want to come back to yes. that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I was also thinking on a different time to the time when I was thinking about starving to death um, <laughs> about how we have, you know, we've locked in approximately 40 years of, of effects from the emissions that we've already created, the things we've done to the natural world. I was imagining what if, you know, we, you know, a bunch of people now suddenly start thinking, yeah, we should do something about that. Because as you were saying, we have a lot of the tools that we need to do stuff once we decide we do want to do it. Um, and 50 years from now, people are starting to move on from this terrible period we've been in. This becomes just a blip of idiocy and in 500 years everyone's forgotten it even really happened. It's just like some weird niche papal dispute or something that comes up in really esoteric history books. I, was, I thought that would be nice and I felt sad that I wouldn't live to see it. But, um, yeah. <laughs> but also, you know, it was nice to think, yeah, maybe we'll just get it together and you know, we'll muck up a lot of stuff, but we'll, we'll come up with something else. Um, as to what I am thinking about writing, I really want to write a book from the perspective of a web of fungus. Um, I, I, my last book, I it's neat. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my last book, I, I was intended to be both a historical novel about a shipwreck that my great great grandfather was in, but I also wanted to try writing some of it from the perspective of an octopus. So I did that. Um, and now I'm like, what about if you had to write a novel from multiple points of view, but they're all the same creature? Uh, how would you go about doing that? So yeah, that's the kind of thing that gets me fired up and gets me starting to write something. Um, I think it will be set like 300, 400 years in the future in a rewilded forest, probably in Yorkshire. <laughs> the end. <laughs> At least you could give an answer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I don't know what it will be. No. I mean, I thought I was writing a historical novel about a shipwreck, so yeah. see how well that went. Mm. Yeah. I'm um, interested in, um, perhaps you might have thought about this a bit more, Ben, with a young family, um, what children's writing should look like to hold the sort of truth of the condition of the environment, yet also offer some kind of hope. And I guess um, not having kids myself by choice, but friends with kids where um, they've articulated that their kids are inevitably getting this sort of passive exposure to desperation mm. about the condition of the environment and you know, what role does writing have um, in that children's space? That's a really good question. And I, I don't feel like I know enough about children's literature to answer it well, um, only insofar as I was a reader of you know, children's literature 25, 30 years ago. I mean, I, I feel, I mean, my kids are all under five and so in that sense, it's, it's really, for them, you know, you're trying to introduce the basics of these sorts of themes. And books, which, picture books or whatever that can do that are great, you know. Um, you know, we, take, we took the kids to the, the rally out here a few weeks ago and, you know, they just got hot and tired. But at least, you know, you, it's an event and you can, you can use that as a way of explaining a little bit about what, what's going on and, and why we're doing things and why it's important. And, and the thing that you often find, in my experience, and maybe more in, in my role as a as a bookseller rather than a writer, is that there are a lot of a lot of authors uh, of children's work have have a real um, heart to explore issues that they feel are important. I mean, this is a really big theme in children's literature, and I feel that for a lot of kids, that becomes a space in which they can engage with ideas that may not be safe elsewhere. Um, so I, I see that, you know, I, I think these books are being written, I think these books will continue to be written in greater numbers and, and provide that kind of a space, both for, for what's going to be really hard in terms of whatever we are, it is we're going to be transitioning to, but whatever, where we, we might find hope in that as well, both as, as individuals and as a community. 
Um, do you have any to, to <laughs> on that? I mean, um, yeah. yeah, and the other side of it is, uh, is that you know books in some space are also quite a marginal thing. You know, I said at the start, books are very, very small, and and books are becoming a more marginal thing. I think in some ways for younger readers as well, which is I think also a broader discussion we might have here about you know how the decreasing place of books in the society might be problematic for writers. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, like you, I don't know kids that well, um, uh, but I. I guess looking back on my own experience is that I was encouraged to read from a very early age and was given access pretty much to whatever books were around the house or whatever I wanted at the library. And I think um, whatever comes along in the future of kids, I guess, have that encouragement to read and that ability to read. They'll find the stuff that they need. There's a lot. I don't know, there's a lot of books out there, as <laughs> you, as a bookseller, would know. Um, you know, like 300 new ones every day. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's stuff out there to find if we if we're letting kids do it, if we're giving them the power to do it. Um, but and also, I think I feel like kids' books, it's pretty much what you were saying, are quite a long way ahead of adults' books in all these kind of themes. The thing that I've, I've been fixated on for quite a while in fiction writing is the lack of animal narrators or animal points of view in books for grown-ups, um, that we are only interested in humans and what humans think and do. Uh, but kids read books narrated by all kinds of crayons. You know, they're, like, <laughs> they're perfectly open to the idea that a crayon can tell a story. And I, I think it's kind of a pity we really cut that option off. Like, it would be good to have I don't know, more crime novels narrated by crayons, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk more about the marginality of books, or should we? Uh, it's pretty, not a question. pretty miserable, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I saw a thing today in, I don't know, one of those conversation-like websites that lets experts talk about something they're hooked up on, um, and some bloke who used to work for news um, was saying that the reason we can't grapple with the drought is because we're too hung up on the ideas of Henry Lawson and Banjo Patterson and that's made us romanticise our ideas of life on the land and that we should have... I was like, this is what a load of crap. I was like, nobody's ever actually read <laughs> Henry Lawson or Banjo Patterson at all. I and mean, if we were fixated on the popular ideas in books, we'd all be, you know... People, people have watched film... But They've seen a film version. Well, yeah, I feel yeah. like we'd all be fixated on being like everyone in Boy Swallows Universe because mm. you know that's the most popular book ever. Um, yes, it to be. Yeah. So yeah, I, I yes. Anyway, yeah. that was an aside because yeah, I don't think books have much effect on anyone anymore. I mean, ever. books books have always been pretty marginal. Yeah. But, I mean, you, it's it's really only you know in recent decades that the, the sort of economic life of societies, both in terms of production and the ability to consume, has meant that books you know, have been really widely distributed. So, so perhaps we're just sort of taking a couple of steps back to the, the kind of place which has been the conventional place of yeah. book in one time. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Some, someone should, a normal person should ask a question. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm the wrong person, sorry. Um, I, I, I don't think, I mean, for all of us here, I mean, I don't want to speak for everyone, but we're here because we do value books, you know, it's the reason we read them, it's the reason we buy them, and anyone who's read a good book understands the value of one. Now, to me, I guess a more important question is how do we write books? You know, so to me, the, the, the value of a book is, is, is inherent, you know, in, in my experience reading books. So should we be writing books like If the World's Ending? Yeah. But how do we write books? As an, you know, someone who does writing, I find it one of the most rewarding and most frustrating things that I can undertake. It's difficult. It's difficult to mo motivate myself to sit down, and you know that process of focusing your mind is so valuable and and um, and rewarding. But it's also difficult. So just from a practical point of view, like what motivates you two as writers? What what's the tipping point where you go right? I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write. How do you actually do it? Um, <laughs> first, thing, first thing I think that we can probably both assure you that your experience is really normal and <laughs> yeah. unlikely to change. <laughs> um, so that, that's just sort of standard territory. Um, for writers, it's just a really hard gig, um, and sometimes it's rewarding, but sometimes it's really, really miserable. I think 
that what I've always found that the most useful thing that you can possibly do is have good habits. Um, because if you sit down at the same time every day and you sit at your desk for, and do the work for as long as you possibly can, um, and you do that every day, your brain builds up an expectation that's just what you've got to do and it's just what you're going to be there for. And so you also sometimes get an inkling of when you need to take a break. But I've always done my best work when I've been in good habits. Um, and I used to, for a long time there, I was just working 9 to 5.30 or something. And I'd take maybe 15 minutes for lunch. But I would build up for, to that, you know. I would, I would just sort of... And, it, and, and in the afternoon, I might do sort of looser, easier kind of work. I just can't do that anymore because I've got little kids. And there are uh, all sorts of things that sort of occupy my attention, whether it be to do with the kids or helping my wife or something, or these kinds of things. But um, but when I'm in that kind of a space, I'm, I'm really ha I'm much happier because I just know what I'm there for, and I've said I've got to do this. And so, in a funny sort of way, you just get dragged around to just saying, "Well, okay, it's it's a kind of acceptance in in the midst of that." So, whether it's all day or whether it's saying that for two hours or three hours every day, you're, at the same time, you're just going to do it. And you're going to do it like a job. It's something you got to do. I always thought that's the best way of getting over the thing that's hard about it and the thing that makes you not want to do it. If you just wait for inspiration, you only write once a month. You know? yeah. I, I would like to slightly disagree with that. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the other thing too is that, is that everything is different for every writer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I used to, you know, I used to be very much of this mantra and there have been times still even recently where I have, I've never written all day with a 15 minute break for lunch. That's absurd. Don't get it together. Yeah. <laughs> that is nonsense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> longest I could possibly manage would be three hours and that would be with a lunch break and a coffee break in it. Um, but I, and when I couldn't write every day, which has been most of my life, because most of my life I've had a five day a week job. Um, so, you know, can't write every day. Um, I have, you know, tried to follow this mantra of, well, you, you sit down at the desk at these times and you write. Whether that's, you know, for three hours Saturday morning or four hours Thursday night, whatever it is, that's what you do. But I think, for me, that is not actually what makes the difference. What makes the difference is learning to tell the voice in my head that's going, you're wasting your time, this is terrible, you're an idiot, why don't you do something? This is, you're wasting your husband's time, you're wasting all of society's time. Getting that voice to just shut up, just being able to say to it, that's cute, thanks. Um, thanks for warning me about how terrible I am. I will have a think about that, but I've just got to write this thing <laughs> first. So how about, let's say in two hours. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that in two hours. That'll be great. I'll get back to you. Just being able to do that. Or I have a friend who every time she gets a little like, this is crap, what you're doing is bad, she just makes a little mark on a piece of paper. Just, you know, she's like, okay, thanks, tell. And, just, and after three or four days of doing that, the tallies just disappear. She can concentrate. Overpowering um, your, your inner critic. Yeah, yeah. just uh, just being able to say to it, shush, 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 later. We'll do th we'll do that. I accept your warning. This is terrible, but we'll discuss it later. In a funny sort of way, that's just another form of habit, though. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. I think that habit is that power of, of just overcoming whatever you, you know you default to that's going to stop you from from writing because yeah. it's really easy to not write. It's yeah. so easy. It's so great. Yeah. I got grass. <laughs> not writing. Got so much best. grass to cut. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, if you do if you do really want to do it, it's hard and you've just you've got to do it, you've just gotta find a way to do it. It's never gonna be easy. Yeah. You're never gonna feel like, yeah, no, I just wanna write and it's gonna be great. Yeah, it doesn't happen. And also if you find something that you would rather do, just do that. Do that. <laughs> I so tell people that all the time. If you wanna play clarinet or get really good at a computer game, do that. Yeah. It's awesome. But like like uh, I, 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 I got, uh, it's a horrible thing to say, and I always remember uh, resenting. I remember talking to a, a senior writer years and years and years ago, it's probably 10 years ago, and I was saying, oh, yeah, probably better not to have started. I always resented that. So if you resent that, I really... <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I look back and I go, you know, he was really probably right. <laughs> you know, it's probably right. If there's something that you would rather do and that you would enjoy doing and get more value out of, then I'd do that. But if you just... I think if, you, if you're sort of a bit nutty and your nuttiness is around words and you're just going to hear like language like that and say, like, screw you guys, I'm just going to go home and write. And you're probably cursed and that's just what you're going to do anyway, <laughs> yeah. no matter what anybody says. And, yeah. <laughs> it's so weird. To, to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, anyway. How many ideas have you had that, you know, at the moment you're thinking this is absolutely perfect, so you start to 
put things together. How often does that happen and what's the sort of percentage that those get set aside or they actually come to fruition? I think every idea I've had has not been enough to sustain a piece of writing. Um, that they're really, they're just the start of a thing. Every idea is just the start of a thing. It's that idea plus some other ideas you might have, plus habit, plus discipline, plus craft. Just, you know, there might be days where you just push through by thinking, well, you know, this needs to have some particular structure to it. Or I've been using too many long sentences. Let's use some short sentences. It's a combination of all those things. The idea is like 5%, I think, of the finished work, generally, for me. I feel that if you uh, think that you've got an idea for a piece, it's a really good idea before you start, it's usually simplistic. Mm -hmm. Because a really interesting piece of writing can't be summed up in one sentence, or one, in a one sen even a visionary one sentence, or a really interesting one sentence. Like, the, the way I tend to feel that it works is that you, the best pieces come where you get a sniff of an idea, and you don't know quite what it is. You just got a sniff that you think that these different things or these things could work together. And it's then in the doing of it that amazingly often you find a way to find out what that piece is and how distinct it is. And that comes back to how diverse ideas and language are. There are so many different ways you can combine ideas that there's always a solution and or there's always multiple solutions and oftentimes if you work at it long enough and then go for enough walks to, to think about it and do this, that and the other, you come to whatever it is that that solution is going to be. Um, yeah, but the idea is that I, I remember I wanted to copy another writer's short story and make it weird um, because I really like the short story and I decided, okay, I'm going to use something of this structure um, and I... I know roughly how I wanted to do it, and I started doing it. And I was just so bored, I was just so bored, <laughs> because I knew exactly what was going to be happening. Um, it was a, a story of some, the way that I was doing it. it. Was a story of some mountaineers coming, trying to escape off this um, mountain, and all these sorts of weird things were happening, but not enough weird for me. So I started having sort of the dead bodies of these mountaineers <laughs> cursing them, and, and yeah, that sort of became fun again. And I said, <laughs> but I, but I, I had to find something else both to broaden the story itself, but to also broaden my experience of writing the story to make it interesting. Did and I was thinking about the story that you mentioned earlier, the one you still like, that, that I read recently, which is a story about a guy who wants to ring up his ex-girlfriend, who is in Berlin, she's in another time zone, communication's difficult, he finds a way to call her, and Tony Gregg, the cricket commentator who's dead, answers the phone, and he ends up having a conversation with Tony Gregg instead. It's like, <laughs> great idea but what I would really like is <laughs> if you presented 10 different writers who write in all sorts of genres and styles with the idea you're trying to call somebody you once loved and a sporting personality answers the phone tell this story how many different ways might that story be told so yeah that that sort of idea even if all of them were Tony Gregg the stories different. would be completely different mm -hmm. so yeah does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> that's the best we can do. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Ideas are great. Yeah. Yeah. Pack as many of them as you can into a story. Yeah. Did you have any other questions about this that coming back to the No, topic? I feel like we've mostly covered all of my questions. Oh, that's good. Actually, I think. Um, why, don't you, why don't you write uh, for money? I mean, you know, obviously you'd like your fiction to make money, but we all know that doesn't happen. Yeah. Why, do you, why, why, why have you never, why do you sell books or do other things? How come you've never become a professional writer? Um, what do you mean by professional writer? The this? sort of nonsense that I do. Like where, copywriting stuff? Yeah, or being a communications person, or writing websites, or being a journalist. Uh, I think it's just, it's not so much a grand plan, it's just what you fall into. I mean, I, I think... I mean, I, I've done some copywriting here and there, but again, it's mostly if somebody says, hey, can you do this? And I go, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I go, okay, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll do that. I don't have any ethical argument against doing that, and I can do that, probably. I go and do it, and it's kind of fun and fine, and they pay me much more money than you would normally expect, and you go, fabulous. But, I mean, my, my experience writing, I mean, in finding, carving out time for writing is, I think, that a couple of things, and part of it was just trying to save as much money as possible in my 20s and early 30s so that 
I would have time down the track to be able to write. Because the thing with writing is it's really hard to make money no matter what yeah. it is you yeah. do. Um, and so developing that, but also a sort of an overarching strategy for sort of living really simply and setting yourself up to some extent so that you can afford to... So in one sense, I don't need to make an extraordinarily amount of money from writing, just at this stage of my life anyway, yeah. because of decisions that I made earlier on. Um, so I can have the luxury to some extent of writing what I want to write. Um, but to the extent, I, I mean, I would do more of it if I kind of wanted to or if I knew yeah. what I was doing or, or had more pathways into that. Because writing is kind of fun in a funny way, no matter what it is you're doing. It kind of is. So if, if um, for whatever reason, you know, I, I had more opportunity to do more money-making work, that I had didn't object to, and it didn't interfere with work that I really wanted to do, then I'd, I'd have no principled objection to it. But you know, you fall into whatever it is you're doing. I think your your answer about how you have managed to simplify your life is also partially an answer to your question about how do you write is mm -hmm. to remove financial pressures wherever you can, so that you can relax into writing a little bit mm -hmm. instead of feeling like it's taking time away from I should be at work or you know. I, sh I need to be making some money, this is a waste of time. Mm. So, yeah. But there are also ways of making right money from creative work as well. And I think in a funny sort of way, if, if you are able to get into that position of just simplifying your life, you know, not travelling overseas, not eating out, not these sorts of things, just eating... I mean, my, my funny sort of theory, real estate blows a lot of this out of the water these days, but my theory is that, you know, back in the 50s, we thought that there would be a time where, uh, because of automation and changing technology, um, we would have a lifestyle where you could um, only work a couple of days and everything else would be fine. And my theory is that's perfectly, that's happened, I'll do that. It's just I'll live a lifestyle rooted in the 1950s. You know, yeah, yeah, you know, I just won't do all of these new sort of things that, that people feel like they need to do. I'm perfectly content. Um, and, I, and I think that... Um, as I say, the real estate side of things, particularly as that's changing in the Tasmanian space, is, is making that much more difficult and those traditional Tasmanian lifestyles are, are much more difficult than what they used to be. Um, so that, that's a different space now. But I, I feel that up to a point still that is, it is possible. It's to say that if you just live simply, if you find um, that you can just throw together enough money by working a day or two in a, a real job and making some money here and there by selling the story or getting the odd grant or teaching or whatever it is. You know, you can live a, a simple but quite happy life and having time to do what it is you want to do. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. might be environmental activism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or, or comics. Yeah, or comics. <laughs> Something else yeah, other yeah. than work. Um, more questions? Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, for people, there are various different creative forms um, that we can do. Writing's one, obviously, uh, creating music, sculpture, visual arts, photography, whatever. What distinguishes writing from those other less word-oriented oh, forms? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does it make you think more deeply? I mean, um, the process of creation of a piece of music compared to the creation of a an essay or whatever in words, what, how are they different? Do you mean from the perspective of the person who's making or the person who's yeah. making? I don't know. Yeah, do you know. I was a photographer for a while, not to your standard. Um, and I have played a number of musical instruments and written quite a few very bad pop songs. Um, <laughs> So I, I don't think there's anything I've ever done creatively that I've been... Oh, I used to sew amazing skate pants that I sold in shops that I designed myself. Did you really? Uh, yes, I did. They were called Don't Ollie in the House was my brand. Did you have them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they've all been worn out. Actually. Yeah, of course. Um, yes, they're gone. Um, but I don't think I was as good at any of those as I was at writing, so I still feel like I'm kind of in your position in that I can't really compare because I, I never reached a level both of artistry or of discipline, I think, in any of those things that I have in writing. All of them were hobbies. Writing doesn't feel like a hobby. It's more vocational, I think. Um, so, I, But it's just because that's what I have an aptitude for, I think. I feel that there are probably commonalities because it's just sufficient to say that, you know, I've talked with artists and particularly artists, I'd say, but also people of other practitioners. And you could often find 
real strong points of common ground in how you go about your work and feel about your work and experience your work, but also sufficient hints that there are real divergences in the way that you go about thinking about things. I mean, the way that someone who's a visual artist think, thinks about something and, and, and sees something, um, I'm always struck when I, when I have that conversation. That's very distinct to how I would go about thinking of something in text. But it's not, a, it's not a, it's not a, I don't have access to that person's brain and I don't necessarily yeah. know enough to be able to compare adequately, I would think. Yeah. It's writing is frustrating in some ways because it does, it feels, I, I don't know, I often feel restricted by that form. Mm -hmm. If you are more experimental than I am, um, so maybe you don't have that. But yeah, I, mm -hmm. I sometimes feel like I wish I had access to other ways of expressing the things that are, like, can I really write a novel from the point of view of a fungus? Would that be, would that work much better in a different art form than it does in writing? Because words seem, they're very human, I guess. They're very limiting in, in their humanness. So, yeah. I guess my question also related back to that original thing that I posed, um, the connection between writing and thinking. And because we're using words and our thinking can be in words, at least in part, is writing special because it's got a more direct relationship with thinking as opposed to creating music, which isn't necessarily, you don't think perhaps in the same way to make a piece of music? I, my inclination is no. I feel like that, that words in some way are an intellectual barrier to understanding exactly what it is the other person is saying to you, that, that things that you feel more immediately are perhaps better at conveying something, music, particularly, I guess, I'm thinking of. Um, but yeah, also visual arts. Smells, I feel like it would be just, it would be so great if you could write things in smells and convey the emotions that smells give you to somebody else. But yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, it, it feels, it's very two-dimensional to me, writing. It's just, it, it depends. <laughs> See, words, <laughs> I'm having trouble with it. Um, yeah. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if I feel that. I, I totally hear what you're saying. And it might just be a naivety with respect to, to me. But I've always felt that you know, having the opportunity to, to deal in, with books and articles, which is usually the most considered way that somebody has, at least of expressing themselves in a certain direction. So it means a certain engagement with that person that you're not likely to get in any other sphere. And that... Whether that's less effective in some ways because of exactly what you're talking about may be the case. And yet I really value that point of engagement in such a deep and considered and lengthy way with the contents of somebody's mind. So, I mean, maybe that's... The funny thing is you're more likely to spend... The length of time you're likely to spend with that person on a, on a train of thought like that is, is longer than perhaps you're likely to spend with many other art forms, although with a, a piece of music you might listen to it over and over again and that's a, a different kind of length, I suppose, in terms of repetition. But where, where, where that stacks up and how they relate to each other and all these kinds of things, I, I don't feel like I've, I've thought enough about it to say or, or even have the, the means of comparison to some extent. But I can say that I really value that mm. in deep uh, in relationship with, with somebody's brain in, in the text. Yeah. I have a question about that actually. Um, in uh, assuming that there's a bit of erosion around our collective attention spans, do you think you've actually got to work harder to hold people or are books getting shorter with our busy lives? I'm seeing a re-emergence of novellas and shorter novels, I think, but still People in Australia like to feel like they're getting their money's worth. <laughs> so, so, you know, things are always published in $30 trade paperbacks first. As, I mean, that also provides more money for the publisher. And there's, that's the large form of paperback. So I think, but I think that is, that you are still seeing sort of shorter novels, more, more published than they once were. Um, and that may reflect that attention span issue. Um, everything that I can think of, though, that provides any answer to that question is anecdotal, which is and almost almost personal. Where I sort of feel like I, I and maybe you'd recognise it in yourselves. You recognise when you've been dealing with a scatty medium how scatty your attention mm -hmm. can get. 
and you recognise, I mean, sometimes I find that you need a gateway book. Like you go, I've been doing this really scatty thing, so I'm going to read just a hardcore genre novel, and that'll be my gateway back into mm -hmm. to books where, I don't mean to diminish genre novels, I really like a good genre novel, but, um, but it, it's often that easier read that will push yourself along and say, you know, you don't need to work too hard, but you are reading a book and you're going to work your way to the end, and your brain sorts to go, like this, <laughs> and then you go, okay, well, I'm going to read something that might be a more challenging read, whether, whatever it might be, and, and you can feel your attention span. You know, like in, in a relatively short period of time, being modified. I mean, I remember once working through a, a really long and disgustingly difficult book of German philosophy, and, um, and I felt like, uh, you know, I would just read sort of 10 to 20 pages a week, but I felt like out of that, I could just read anything. <laughs> you know, it, was, it really does feel like that exercise thing where your capabilities in another sector are advanced by, uh, by doing that, but it, you seems to lose it. As for somebody who's natively brought up in a scatty medium, Though I don't know, I've got no idea as to whether that people have that ability to move from scattiness to more concentration more easily. I just don't know. Do you know any of you, you, I make things up and you, you, know, you have research. <laughs> you, you deal no, with facts more. I, right? I, I, I feel like all the research on this is still mostly contradicting all the other research on this. Okay, and yeah. so, yeah, my answers would be just as personal and anecdotal as yours, which would be that I am... As you know, a pretty intensive Twitter user. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and can um, and it's one of the weirdest mediums. What a strange thing yeah. to have to to just read through. Like every tweet takes a second to read, and they're all completely different, and none of them are joined to each other. And I can do that for an hour. And um, yeah, and uh, and really enjoy it often, and as a as just a really great experience of all so many things all together, and then pick up a book, and if the book is good, I will read that book for hours. Um, so yeah, I think you know, it's a, I think a lot of our experiences of having trouble concentrating on things might be because the things just aren't that interesting, um, <laughs> and there are now a lot more interesting things. There are so many interesting things to choose from in this modern time with the internet and all. Um, books do have to work a bit harder, I think, to be, because there are so many alternatives to just be, like, good, be better, and, you know, make people want to read you. Yeah, it's interesting, that, isn't it? I, I was doing a, a talk down in Guinea a few months ago, and we got around to the, just the sort of weirdness in, in mediums, and I was discussing, we were discussing, like, so, someone like David Lynch's work, which includes a lot of his real elements in, in some of his um, cinema and, in, in obviously, his television. Um, but in some ways a book can't get away with that in quite the same way because you always have to be working harder with a book. So if you're going to be um, including the same sorts of difficulties that cinema does uh, in text, you've either got to accept that lots of people are just going to not bother keeping going, they're not just on a couch having stuff presented to you, they're either going to turn off, which is fine, you might be quite happy with that, um, or you're going to have to do lots of real tricks to keep people yeah. going <laughs> you're have to be along more the way, rewarding. more yeah. rewarding to people along yeah. the way in order to keep them going through that kind of thing. And so that's a particular challenge with, with books and attention spans yeah. that perhaps other mediums don't have in the same way. Yeah. I'm, I'm listening to my first audio book at the moment. I'm, I don't know how this anecdote's going to go. I haven't thought about it or <laughs> said it beforehand. Let's see how it goes. Um, which is an experimental novel. It's up for an experimental novel prize at the moment. The book itself, I think, is about this thick. I can't tell. because it it's ducks? A, No, it's not ducks, <laughs> okay. which I was going to raise. No, it's uh, The Porpoise, Mark Haddon's book. Oh, right. Yeah, Great. which I don't know if you've read, but it's uh, a got, lot weirder than you might think it was going to be. Um, but... So yeah, it is a novel where the characters keep becoming other characters and shifting into completely different scenarios that are not the ones they were in before and you're not sure if they're the same people or different people or where you are anymore or what time period this is. Is this real or are they imagining it? And I'm listening to it, not reading it. But his sentences and his details and his um, sensory descriptions of everything are so compelling that I have at no point gone, I want to stop 
doing this. I'd rather do something else. Um, and I would put it on you know, while I'm doing the dishes and look for more dishes to do so I can keep going. So, That's great. Yeah. And, and is it particular? I've got something to say about that, but is it particular to the audio format that you think makes it easier? because yeah. I haven't... Well, I've often found audio books... This is the first one I'm going to finish, I think, yeah. ever. Because um, <laughs> I find it really hard to concentrate on them, generally. Yeah, OK. Yeah. I, I, I thought what was interesting there, uh, and, uh, that he has gone and written an experimental novel, and, and I think that it's a good thing to challenge ourselves to be reading these kinds of figures, because, I mean, they're, they're such interesting things, because it's so brave of a writer to challenge themselves to write something like this, particularly someone like Mark Haddon, who's had a... I wouldn't say totally, but largely conventional sort of literary space Yeah, beforehand. been very and successful and made a heap of money. <coughs> made a heap of money. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to totally mangle this quite quite. Yeah, go on. But, I, but I was, um, I was discussed, or at least I was in correspondence with Ryan O'Neill, who's a, a really good Australian experimental writer who you should write for, because he's really funny as well. His book, Their Brilliant Careers, is, is fabulous. Um, but Ryan was, was talking about a quote that Mark had and said prior to... Um, to, or at least try to thinking about this book, which was that the, the, the suite, and I'm going to mangle this, but the suite of words is just so amazing that just to continue writing the same straightforward novel over again is like having a, you know, a huge Porsche, Porsche and just taking it down to the shops and back every day. <laughs> and at, at some point he just got sick of that trip to the shops. And, <laughs> and, and I think that that's, that's true, is that you know, writing has the ability to do so many interesting and amazing things. Yeah. And here he is having a, a crack Having at a this. crack at something super weird. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but the audio stuff, I mean, is that interesting? Do you think that the fact that it's being presented to you is, makes it easier? Is it easier? I, don't, I think it's harder. It's harder? I think it's harder. Yeah, OK. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Why? Um, I've never listened to one myself. Mm. Give it a try and see what you reckon. Anything that has squirrely little tiny little words in a, yeah, in a page, okay. I find that as my eyes get worse and worse as I get older, I find it very difficult to do. So I keep thinking, shall I get into the audio book thing? I think it's harder because when you're reading a book, all you can do is read a book. Mm -hmm. Like, I, 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 you can go for a walk, and I have done it, but it's <laughs> ill-advised. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, poles and stuff, cars. <laughs> Um, yeah, when you're reading, you just have to read. When you're listening to something, you can do other stuff and it's, your mind can wander very easily onto the other stuff mm. that you do, like driving, which is what I do while I'm listening. I try not to think about driving at all, just concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think that's, that's what makes it harder, is okay. your, your mind can wander. Yeah. It's now up to nine o'clock, so um, we should probably draw it to a close. Yes. Thank you very, very much, Ben and Jane. Really, really appreciate it.